tonight's snowy edition. Yeah. Our speaker was well received a couple of years ago when she was here. So in discerning and praying about who we would speak to topics relevant to now, her name came up. Uh, she was very willing. Uh, we're grateful for this sacrifice. Uh, even with she is married with seven children uh -huh. in Minnesota. Woo! So that yep. shows us how important we are that she would come be with others of God's children. Um, she ran a Newman Center many years, or for many years. Yeah. Uh, so she loves Newman Centers. She actually ran the University of Minnesota Duluth. Go Bulldogs! Uh, which is where Father Mike Schmitz is. So um, she may have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but the topic, I'll let her expound upon it, but... How do we love others well, especially in our culture now where we're talking about um, abortion might be on the ballot again in the fall. And so how do we love them both? How do we love women well in a way that's empowering, in a way that's fully authentic, in a way that's fully Catholic? So to speak on Catholicism and feminism, Leah Jacobson. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Father. That's fun. All right. I don't even know if I need this, but I'll, I'll try to kind of use it. We'll see how this goes. Um, all right, first of all, we're going to do a drawing at the end of the night. So I want to give you a heads up on it. We'll maybe pass the papers around later if you want. But we are giving away some of our shirts that we had at the SEEK conference. I don't know if any of you guys went to SEEK this year, Focus. Some of you were there. Yeah, that was fun. Um, so we've got a Stella Maris shirt that's Star of the Sea. Uh, what does it say, Star of the Sea? Lead us to thee, I think. Is that what it says? Lead, guide us to thee. Guide us to thee, Guide, because we're guiding star. That's right, that makes sense. Uh, and the other one is a St. Joseph, anchor of families. Pray for us. So we've got Our Lady and Joseph together to make the ultimate dynamic duo there. And then we're also giving away a set of two books. Uh, which is The Happy Girl's Guide to Being Whole, What You Never Knew About Your Natural Body, and then the secret book that we don't sell anywhere publicly, that little blue book next to it is its companion, and that's The Catholic Girl's Guide to Being Happy, Holy, and Whole. Uh, and the reason, interestingly enough, I'm giving like all this Catholic swag away because we don't actually sell any of this publicly because we're technically, uh, and I think we're live streaming this so like anybody on the internet can hear this right now, but we don't publicly you know, introduce ourselves as a Catholic organization. The work that I do at Guiding Star Project, it's my nonprofit that I founded, we open up women's healthcare centers, and we focus on natural fertility, childbirth, and breastfeeding. We focus really hard on women's bodies. What do women's bodies do that are incredibly amazing and unique? They ovulate, they gestate, they lactate, it's our superpowers. You don't have to be Catholic to think that's awesome. And so we get women from all persuasions, all backgrounds coming into our centers, wanting to learn their natural fertility, wanting to learn to chart their cycle, wanting to have a water birth. We're just starting birthing centers this year, so please pray for us. We're opening our first birthing centers this spring, so we're actually delivering babies now. And then I'm a board certified lactation consultant, actually, in my free time with all my children and my nonprofit. Uh, and so breastfeeding is like this incredibly amazing thing that so many women need help with because even though it sounds super natural, it is really hard sometimes. Like it's just not easy. So the work at Guiding Star is it came from the heart of the church. It came from theology of the body. It came from, quite frankly, Stella Maris, uh, Star of the Sea Adoration Chapel in Duluth, Minnesota. So that's why we're Guiding Star. That's our name. But we don't present ourselves that way because the good news is available to everyone. And sometimes when we put that little like Catholic asterisk besides it, people just don't listen. And you know what? We're in the business right now of just proclaiming the goodness of the female body and the human body, and we don't want anyone not to hear it because they heard Catholic. So we're clearing out our Catholic swag, whatever was left from Seek. So sign up to win. I'd love to give it to you. Um, and we've got lots more. So if you email me, I could probably just send you some too. So, all right. Yeah, that's my little like disclaimer here at the beginning. Um, yeah, so I did. I ran a Newman Center for a long time. I, I do know Father Mike Schmitz, yes. I was, I was actually his first employee, which is kind of funny, when he was a newly ordained priest. Um, he was my boss. <laughs> and the same personality you see online is the guy that shows up to your Monday morning meeting, totally unprepared and like, <laughs> just kind of like, what are we talking about today? <laughs> like, <laughs> 
So I actually lived and worked in the Newman house where Father Mike lives now. I lived there for the first three years of my marriage. So I look at you guys and I like remember so clearly being 21 years old, getting married to my, my husband. We've been married now for 20 years this year. We've had seven babies in the last 20 years. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember so clearly bringing that baby home to that college campus, living around 11,000 college students right out our back door, breastfeeding this baby on campus, and just realizing like how ill-prepared I was, even as a Catholic young woman, even as somebody who had like learned to love life, we had learned to you know practice NFP somewhat, we weren't real good at it. Um, our first four babies came in five years, so that was wild. Um, we then found a different method of NFP, which worked much better for us. <laughs> and that method, then our next three babies came in 10 years. So if you're using NFP, if you're a newlywed, if you're like, I'm destined to have 45 children, it might not be. I, I felt, I actually started calculating after I had my fourth baby. I, I started doing the math. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm only like 26 years old. <laughs> and I was like, how many years of fertility do I have left? And I calculated out, I'm like, I'm having 27 children. <laughs> I was like, God, you wouldn't do this to me. Um, but it was a real like test, because quite frankly, I grew up in the 80s. I was born in the 80s. I'm, I'm old. Um, but I grew up at the height of really that kind of third wave of the feminist movement, where it talked so much about, like, as a woman, you owe it to other women to be successful. Like you owe it to the sisters to like be a doctor, be a lawyer, like don't have babies, have a career because that's what's gonna make you happy. Like that's what's gonna mean you're successful. And I didn't fall for that totally. I was kind of spared. I had a, a kind of a grace in my life in that I was raised in a very faithful Catholic home. Uh, but I think actually, I mean, my faith and my parents' lives had a lot to do with it. But I also grew up on a dairy farm, which there is just something very sobering about being a farm kid. like. You're seeing life, you're seeing death, you're seeing the reality all around you every day of nature. And the closer you are to nature, the closer you are to like sunrise and sunset and plant the seed and watch it grow and harvest it, you stay kind of in sync with what God intended. There's just a reality to the world. It's ordered. There's a biological reality to our bodies. There's a natural order all around us. And I grew up in that. And I didn't really appreciate it and I didn't really understand it, how special that was, until I was removed from it. I didn't live in a town until I went to college. I lived in the country all the way up until I was 19 years old and I moved to Duluth, Minnesota. And I remember just being disoriented actually for the first couple of weeks because I couldn't see the sunset. I couldn't, like, I couldn't figure out the directions and I was like, this is so weird. Um, and I learned as I talked with my roommates, my new roommate that I had as a freshman who was terrifying to me, I didn't know how to talk to her, I like realized she has a completely different worldview than me. She doesn't believe these the same things I believe. Like, it was just kind of this very strange moment for me to recognize my worldview is different than others. I went to mass every Sunday. I believed that God had a plan for me. I trusted instinctively and intrinsically that God doesn't make mistakes. And that there were certain things that were just not up to me to decide or debate. Like I just knew, like he made me this way, he made you that way, he made the order of the day this way, the plants, the animals, everything. He doesn't make mistakes. And then I took my first Psych 101 class. <laughs> I was a psychology undergrad. So that was a lot of fun to come in with a very firm understanding of reality and a very firm understanding and belief that God is a God of love, God is a God of order, he puts things in order for our benefit, he wants good for us because he loves us. And then you sit in Psychology 101 and you hear all about how, you know, the, the, like reality is what we make it to be. What is your experience of this thing? How do you see this thing to be? You know, where are you at on your journey? How, how self-actualized are you? Um, and the next few years were just this really interesting kind of pushing back. 
Are there any psych majors in here? I always like to just get a sense. Do we have any psychology majors? Are you kidding me? There's not one psych major? I, that's never happened to me. That's like the most common like degree at UMD. Do you guys have a women's studies program? Are there any women's studies majors? Shut up. You want to psychology or Okay, so maybe you're doing like a filtration here at the Newman Center, like. Are any of you taking psychology classes? Okay, because this is a liberal eds, you gotta take some of your liberal ed credits, right? How has your experience been? I would love just to hear, like is it, do you find that they're very rational and they make sense, or do you find yourself feeling like I'm pushing back a lot? It's good? Has it, I mean, have you felt like you've learned a lot? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any uh, women's studies classes? Any minors in here? Or majors? No, nobody's majoring. Any, are there any psych minors? There's a minor, there's a minor. Okay, so you guys are taking some of these classes. I remember it was my last year of college and I had a class on, um, I had a, uh, a marriage and family class that was a psychology class, like, uh, and then I had a um, gender and sexuality class. And my professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth was a man who was in the process of going through his transition. And this was in the early 2000s, and so this was pretty kind of shocking, but it was a very diverse sort of thing at the college, and they were really embracing this. And I, I, he, was, um, he had been a former military. Um, he was actually... Oh gosh, what was it? He played football for the Marines. He was on the Marines football team. So if that tells you anything about the kind of man that would play football for the Marines. He was roughly 280, big guy, really big guy. But he had been taking hormones for about three years that had caused a lot of like muscular atrophy and had caused you know, some different changes in his body to start taking place. The voice, the voice did not change though. That, I will say, that's the one change that didn't happen. And so we had a man that was presenting very femininely, but he had a very deep voice. And I remember throughout that course of that semester, you know, listening to him share his experience of feeling like he was in the wrong body and wanting to you know, just feel like he fit in some place. Um, and he talked a lot about actually the military mindset and the masculinity of the military and the football and just how toxic it was because he felt like you know, he didn't want to hurt people. And he wanted to be a kind person, but he just felt that that was so looked down upon and that he had to fit this ultra-masculine mold that never fit right. And so at some point he discerned, I must not be a man because to be a man means that I want to hurt people and that I want to be aggressive and that I, I want to dominate. And he said, I don't have those desires. I don't want to dominate people. So he went through this entire process you know, of, becoming, of becoming a woman. And as the semester went on, the effects of these different hormones, he would randomly break down crying in class. And he would be very emotional. And as a 20-year-old college student sitting there watching this, not even sure how to receive it, at the time I just remember feeling so much like compassion. Because it was a clearly wounded person who had had very difficult experiences. And I didn't have much to offer except for just, you know, I think you're a good person. Like, I think you're a nice human being. I, I don't know what else to say. And he and I formed a nice relationship throughout that semester. And I tried to kind of keep track and see whatever happened to him. But he left the university the next year. He left teaching, he left everything, and I think he kind of went very quiet. Because it wasn't, I think, as I look back on it now, 20 years later, it wasn't delivering what was promised to him. You know, that sense of like, you're going to feel so much better about yourself. You're going to feel self-actualized, all the different things. This is gonna be who you are. Um, and it wasn't delivering it. And so he ended up going very quiet. But it, it's one of those experiences that always just stuck with me. Because what he became victim to, I think, is what I was kind of becoming victim to in a little bit of a way of, I was getting the feminist sort of dropped on me, like, you gotta be a career woman, you gotta go do this, you gotta have, you know, don't have kids right now, that's gonna really throw you off course, you're not gonna be happy. And he, on the other hand, was told, like, to be a man, you gotta be really ultra masculine and you gotta be really dominant and you're gonna, and both of us, unfortunately, were fed a lie. We're fed a lie because 
these stereotypes, these gender stereotypes of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And women's gender stereotypes have changed much more than men's have in the last hundred years, and that's why women have been much more confused and much more conflicted, I think. I think everybody's confused about what a woman is. I mean, there was a whole documentary <laughs> this last year, What is a Woman? Or, uh, but men also have gone through this, that there have been such rigid ideas and stereotypes that have been set up that you must fit into this idea of masculine and feminine if you are a man or if you are a woman. And if you don't fit the stereotype, you're the one that's wrong. It's not the stereotype that's wrong. You're the one that's wrong. You need to change yourself to either get on board with the stereotype that matches your body or, or your body actually doesn't matter. That could be the problem. You could just change your body because the stereotype is actually what matters here. And when we stop and think about that, we know how ridiculous that is when we just say it out loud, because we can look across cultures, we can look across time, and we can see, what does a man look like in a different culture in a different time? Well, in Scotland, he wears skirts, you know? What does a woman look like in a tribe in Africa? Well, you know, she may not have any hair or any adornment, and she doesn't wear a shirt. You know, things change across cultures. Expectations for man, for woman, for how you present changes tremendously on time, on location. So the stereotype of what makes you man or what makes you woman is completely arbitrary. The thing that should be providing us our strongest guidepost, our strongest you know, clue, is the body God gave us. God doesn't make mistakes. He made you exactly how he intended you to be. And there is something about the body he gave you that if you pay attention and you listen to it and you really take the time to just allow your body to guide you, it's gonna teach you some really deep spiritual truths about yourself. So when I started to have those babies, I didn't even know that I wanted kids, you guys. I was not the girl that was like, I'm gonna have seven babies. If you had told me that when I first got married, I think I would have been like, I'm out. Like, no, <laughs> no way. And then if you would have been like, actually, you're going to breastfeed those babies and like be pregnant for like over a decade of your life, I would have been like, I am absolutely out. This is not what I want to do. I wanted to learn. I wanted to be you know, well-educated. I wanted to get my master's degree, my PhD, and I wanted to you know, do all of these different things. Which, by the way, kids didn't stop any of that. And that's the other lie, for women in particular. Like, I just want to say to you ladies, like, your babies come along with you, and an educated mother it is never a waste to educate a mother because what you learn, you multiply by every one of your kids. So the education that I've gained has been multiplied by seven because I don't keep that inside. I tell my kids everything I learn. So think about that. The investment of an educated mother is tremendous. Don't think that now that you're a mom, that you're done. I'm just gonna be home raising babies and I'm gonna just you know homeschool and read third grade curriculum for the rest of my life. No, no, no. Like, if you have that desire and that gift, it is not a bad desire. Don't shame yourself. Don't think I'm a bad mom. God gives us these desires, these gifts, these talents. The person that you are, the unique body you were given, the unique talents you were given, the gifts. I don't know if any of you have ever done, like, Strengths Finder. Have you guys, do you guys do those, like, assessments? Disc inventories. Who's done the Strengths Finder? That's, I think, one of my favorites. A couple of you. I think it's so important that you take the time to get to know who God made. You are unique and irrepeatable. There will never be another person with your exact combination of gifts, strengths, and experiences. Somebody could have the same like profile on whatever, you know, strengths or discs or whatever the code, whatever, M code. I'm trying to think what the other ones are. Temperament tests. There's lots of them. Somebody could match you perfectly on that. But they will never match the experiences that you've had. And that unique combination of a human being, God puts that all together for a purpose and for a mission. He's going to give you some call in your life to do something that no one else is going to be called to do. If you're not listening, if you're not paying attention, if you're not getting to know how might God be using me, what can I uniquely do, the world's going to miss out on whatever it is, whatever that unique call is. It comes, it comes like, a, like a burning sort of like you can't not do it. 
That's how I experienced you know, my work with Guiding Star and the nonprofit. It was something that I became so convicted and so passionate about because I saw the need. I stood there as a mom, a young mom on a college campus, recognizing that these students around me, these people that I'm talking to as a campus minister, they're terrified of their fertility. They're scared of their bodies. They don't think that they can raise children. They're hesitant to commit in marriage because they don't know that they're capable of loving or, or deserving of being loved. And as I understood that problem, like God dropped on me a mission that became like burning and all-consuming. And I couldn't not do it. But it took a lot of self-awareness for me to recognize, oh, I'm actually gifted in this area. I actually should use my gifts to do this. And to not do this in some way is a rejection. Now, I was in mom's groups at the time because I went to a lot of different moms, and I still go to mom's groups, but I'll never forget, I was in a Catholic mom's group, and these are some of the loveliest women I've ever met in my entire life. But I, another mom in the group basically said to me at that time, the thing I regret the most, and she was a little bit older mom, and it really, really convicted me, and it really like struck me. She just said, the thing I regret the most is that I didn't, um, that I worked. I regret having worked. I, w I wish I had stayed home with my children. It was kind of a lie that I bought that I, didn't, that I should be working. And I remember thinking, yes, but, but the way that it was presented to me at the time, I was just going back to school to start doing some things because I had like three or four little kids at home and I was like, my brain feels like it's like atrophying. I can't listen to Caillou one more time. <laughs> like, I just can't handle this anymore. Like, I have to have intellectual conversation. I need to talk to adults. And so I started going to night school. And I felt such a shame from the Catholic moms around me saying, no, that's not what you should do. Like a good woman, a good mom, a Catholic woman looks like this. And it was very narrow. And I remember being so like, like conflicted. Like, can I be a good Catholic mom and still work? Can I be a good Catholic mom and go do my master's degree? Because my children need me. And through this like, battle and this struggle, like, it led me to really dig into feminism. And I was like, who's deciding right now what a woman is? Who's deciding what women should be? And I looked at the feminist movement and I decided for myself, these sort of stereotypes, these sort of ideas, what's floating around all of it, none of it takes into account the unique nature of man and woman. None of it is taking into account that I don't exist by myself anymore. I'm a married woman. My husband is just as much a part of the equation right now on what I should do and what kind of a mom I should be and how our children are going to be. I found it really fascinating that feminism very rarely includes men in the equation except for that they don't belong here, except that we need independence from men. And this, I think, is why past feminism and why everything that's kind of been given to us from the women's movement has been so incomplete. Because we pretend that we can exist on our own. We pretend that we're going to be able to find happiness on our own. And I can tell you, after 20 years of marriage, nothing that I do would be possible without my husband. Like holding down the fort, taking seven kids to school today, figuring everything out, supporting me, loving me, and affirming to me, this is who God made you to be. If he had any doubt about who I am, or if he had any sense of like, mm, I don't think that's the right thing for you to do right now, I would stop, full, full stop, and say, okay, is my discernment wrong? Because God gives you this grace in the sacrament of marriage where you have another person to reflect back to you in prayer, you know, who God made you to be. I pray, pray, pray that all of you end up with holy marriages if you're called to that vocation. If you're not called to that vocation, I pray you end up with holy friends around you because you are never going to know yourself fully by yourself. Every one of us was made for relationship. The unique crazy part about man and woman relationship, like romantically, like our bodies were made for each other, like our minds, our spirits, everything. But you're not meant to be alone. None of you. Even those of you that really like to be alone, like you'd rather not talk to your roommate, you'd rather just like 
go, you know, eat by yourself. And if somebody sits down at the table, you're like, your every instinct is to get up and move. <laughs> like, I know some of these people. I, knew, I don't know if any, you, they're not here, they left. Those are the ones that left. Like, I saw them leaving and I was like, that's them. <laughs> they need to come back. <laughs> come back in, the loners. Um, I just want you to hear, you're not meant to be alone. God said that. You know, it's not good for man to be alone. Let us make for him a helpmate. And then Adam sees Eve and he says, at last, somebody that gets me, at last. Like, this is a fulfillment of me. God also wired us biologically. The nature of all of it, when I talk about the closer to nature you are, that you can just see things realistically, there are parts of being a woman and parts of being a man that don't make any sense without the other. It just doesn't make sense, you guys. So much of our bodies, I mean, physically, we don't make any sense by ourselves. Look in the mirror, you're like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and then you see the other side, and you're like, oh, now that makes sense. Okay, got it. But hormonally, chemically, there's attraction that happens naturally. You know, the whole thing with pheromones and the whole, like, thing with... You know, when women are ovulating, like men all of a sudden are very attentive and like all these really weird things that are just nature. That's not socially constructed. That's God constructed. That's God not making mistakes. That's God saying, I made you for relationship. You're attracted. Like this is something that's good for you. This is a beautiful thing that's gonna help you to realize what I made you for. Like let it be, let it happen. And our world has done a really great job of really confusing the heck out of all of it. Because we don't understand attraction anymore. We don't understand our desires anymore. We second guess everything. We don't know ourselves. There's a, who, who is it? Christopher West always says it. You can't know who you are unless you know whose you are. Because the creator dictated who we are. If you don't know God, it's really hard to understand why God made man and God made woman. Because the nature of God is both masculine and feminine. It's both receptive, I receive you, I accept you as a woman. It's both me and it's also masculine. I cover you, I protect you. If we don't know God, man and woman don't make sense. So without God, it doesn't make sense for us to identify as man or as woman. So, somebody, before I came up, just I said, what should we talk about? They said, the Barbie movie. <laughs> I was like, that's actually a really interesting point. <laughs> Who's seen the Barbie movie? I would love somebody to actually tell me the point of this movie. I, do you understand it? OK, give me your analysis of the Barbie movie. OK. Do you want a mic? <laughs> okay. But the point of the Barbie movie was this. It kind of sucks to be a woman in a man's world, like when you're not like understanding each other, and it sucks to be a man in a woman's world mm. understanding each other. So you need to work together in order for stuff to run smoothly and for like, you know, things to be perfect. Okay, give her a round of applause. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. I watched it on an airplane, so I, I probably wasn't the most alert. But I got done and I was like, what just happened? <laughs> I, I, I thoroughly like laughed and I enjoyed it. I found myself like, this is hilarious. Like, you know, there's funny lines in it. But in the end, as I tried to figure out the overarching theme of this movie, like what is this saying? What is the cultural commentary that we're talking about with man and woman? I couldn't come out to a clear conclusion, except what you said is right that if the, if the world is masculinely dominated, it's going to be miserable for someone who's feminine to fit into it. And if it's femininely dominated, it's going to be miserable for a man to fit into it. But the thing that I think the movie lacked, and this is where I kind of was like, that didn't really feel like fulfilling. I got done watching it and I was like, rrr, rrr, like, it didn't give us a compelling marching path forward of what it looks like when men and women cooperate. Did anyone else feel that after the Barbie movie? Like, what does it look like for Ken to like be happy and for Barbie to be happy and for them to work together? It was just weird. <laughs> I don't know. Did, I, I felt that way. What do you think? It was like 
tried to grow like she was on the way to the right answer, but she's not looking in the right places, so it was incomplete. Yes! Okay, I thought the whole section where America Ferrera, where she's like, as a woman, you can't be, you know, too smart, or you have to be smart, but you can't be too smart. You have to be thin, but you can't be too thin. You can't, and where she said, like, all the things you have to be as a woman, but you can't be too much that, otherwise it's not okay. I was like, I felt that. <laughs> I felt that. I was like, she's right. She's right on. So hard. So hard to be a woman. But I kind of wanted to see Ken have his little monologue about that, too. Because he also feels those same pressures. Similarly, like as a man, you know, you can't be too masculine, but you got to be masculine now, or, or it's toxic, or like all the different things. Like I felt like because we've been living in this very shallow, stereotyped idea of the human person, that none of us feel good. <laughs> because none of us are going to be the stereotype. Because God didn't make stereotypes, he made human beings. He made us each unique. Some of the greatest saints that I love the most, like female saints in the church, I mean, Joan of Arc, hello. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you guys, that's not real feminine, is it? Well, I actually think it's incredibly feminine because I think the feminine heart like, seeks to bring peace and justice. And the feminine heart, you know, wants to make things right. And in a sense, she's realized these guys are really a mess and they're disorganized. And I'm going to bring some order. Come on. <laughs> I'll lead this thing. I'll be brave. Feminine hearts are fierce. They're not, like, courage is not something unique to men. That's not unique. But it's the way we lead. And the thing that was inspiring about Joan of Arc to the soldiers that followed her into battle with their lives on the line was her, her purity, her beauty. She was the maiden. They followed the maiden into battle. It was her feminine like, traits that made them feel fearless. Like this is worth dying for. This is something, this is a woman that we believe like her love for God and just the way that he made her so beautiful and so pure, we'll follow her. I mean, that's incredibly feminine. Like just her love of Jesus, that fearlessness. You know, so if we, if we get caught up on what's going to make a woman happy, if we get caught up on, you know, seeking happiness, quite frankly, we're going to lose everything. Like, God didn't make us to just be happy and comfortable. He made us to be exactly who we are. And it's not going to fit in because we're all so unique. I don't know who the stereotype is. I've never met the stereotype of either a man or a woman. I've never met a, per a person that is, like, actually authentically perfectly man or perfectly woman. And I think that's good. So I want to just, you know, encourage each of you, I guess, tonight as we're I mean, we could talk a lot more about feminism. We could talk a lot more about all the things that come with feminism. So this is kind of a different talk for me, actually, because normally I talk about health care. Normally I talk about abortion, and normally I talk about contraception. But what's been striking at my heart recently has just been young people not knowing that God made you exactly the way he wanted to, body and all, gifts and all. And if you're not taking the time to listen to him and ask him, why did you make me this way, Lord? You might miss it. You might miss the one thing he made you for. I would have gone off and been a very high-powered attorney or something if I hadn't let my body guide me. My body decided that I was very attracted to a young man. <laughs> and my faith informed me that we were going to be open to children which equaled us getting married at 22 years of age and welcoming four children in five years. <laughs> and my body then at that moment told me that I had an obligation to care for these children, to breastfeed these children. My body, my hormones, what was happening physically to me in reality was telling me what my purpose and what my, what my happiness would be in those moments. So if you're not, as a lady, like tracking your fertility, if you're not paying attention to your body right now, if you're not letting your hormones speak to you, guys, you too, your hormones are a little more... <laughs> you shouldn't have as much of... <laughs> but the girls do. You guys literally are like... <laughs> 
And for the men in your life, it would actually be a great gift to them if you were tracking it, because it might help them understand you a little bit more. If you're not taking the time to look at yourself and say, Lord, how did you make me? Why did you make me this way? The world is going to tell you. You were made for this. And you're susceptible. Do not listen to the world. Listen to the Lord. He is talking all the time. Turn off that podcast, even if it's Father Mike. <laughs> Turn off that noise. And come to him in silence. Shut everything off and just bring that very simple prayer of reveal. Reveal your purpose in my life, Lord. Just reveal your purpose in my life. And there's lots of us out there that can help you with little bits of it. My work, the stuff we do at Guiding Star, if you got a female body, we can help you make sense of it. That's what we do. We teach you how to have your babies and breastfeed them and how to get pregnant and how to not get pregnant naturally and beautifully. There's lots of organizations, lots of supports that can be out there, but really it has to start at the foot of the cross of just, Lord, reveal to me who I am. And trust, trust, trust. He didn't make a mistake. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing, and your desires. There are disordered desires. There are things that will lead us astray. Bring all of it to the foot of the cross, and he will help you make sense of it. Okay, does anybody actually want to talk about feminism? I mean, we can talk about it. Are there any questions? I know Father mentioned you guys have got some pretty, like, interesting things happening in Arizona. I don't know if anyone's, like, professors are talking about this or not. You've got a ballot initiative coming up on constitutional right for abortion in the state. That's not cool. That's bad. You don't want that to happen. I, we can talk about that if you want. I'm in Minnesota. We have had abortion on our constitution since 1994. We are one of the first states to do it. If you get a chance to help with this campaign to keep it off the ballot, please do so. Because what it looks like when abortion becomes an enshrined right in your state constitution is that there's really no restriction on it. There's really no way for any restriction to be put on abortion. Uh, even things that are just common sense like licensing of abortion providers. That's a really good idea. Nope. I mean, it's all up for debate. When it becomes a constitutional right in your state, it becomes very difficult for you to raise any objection to it. So that, I mean, I wish I had been old enough in 1994 in Minnesota to understand what was happening. I would have been out there. Uh, you guys have an opportunity right now to help educate your classmates, help educate other people. Get, get involved if you can. Because you've got time right here for a little bit. Help out. Become active right now if you can. This is something that really matters. Because as soon as abortion becomes a constitutional right, it also becomes a standard for health care. And then when the standard is destroying a healthy, normal, natural pregnancy, it also becomes a standard to just routinely destroy healthy, normal, natural bodies because you feel different. You feel like it. Does that make sense? It is a bad route to go down. Don't go there. In the state of Minnesota, actually, we've come so far that our children, without any parental notification, can begin receiving cross-hormone therapy in school without parents being notified. So my, any one of my children is at any age. And we've also become a sanctuary state, so children from anywhere around the country that want to receive treatment without the consent of their parents can come to Minnesota and be protected by the state and receive medical care on the state's dime, on taxpayer funding. It can get real crazy real fast. So as potential parents, I don't know if any of you have kids yet, these are things you should care about because God gives you the authority as parents when you become a parent to raise your children and when the state takes that authority away from you, that's a scary place to be. So you're, you have a moment right now. You have an opportunity to get involved and be active. So I just really want to encourage that. I know there's people in Phoenix, I know I talked to some yesterday, that are in, uh, organizing a decline to sign campaign right now, trying to get people to decline signing for this to be on the ballot. And then if it does end up on the ballot, you can also help you know, to uh, vote no. So. I know that's something that's going on here. What else is going on in Arizona? What do we want to talk about here? What's your university? What's happening here? I just have a 
question. Yes. How do you like avoid burnout, like oh. family and like your Oh gosh, that is a really good question. Avoiding burnout. Um, well, first, okay, I, I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna lie. I burn out. I get really tired sometimes, like like bone tired. Like I don't want to do anything tired. Um, it happens, but I also think that when God gives you a mission that you're just like compelled to do, he also sends the helpmates. Like there, it wasn't one apostle. You know, he intended to, you know, Christianize the world. So he sent out 12 and then he sent out partners and he sent out more. You know, he sends other people alongside to help you. And that's the thing I always have to remind myself is that none of this is dependent upon me. And even though I have a high productivity personality where I'm like, I gotta do this, it's up to me. I just have to remind myself, like, God doesn't even need me right now. If God wants this to happen, it'll happen. Like, I'm kind of irrelevant in the equation of all of it. And that always reminds me to just take care of myself and take a break. Like, if I need a nap, someone else will take care of some, it, what needs to be done. So I've gotten a lot better at that. But I find that when I'm burning out, it's because I think I'm, I'm a big deal and that I need to do it. And I remind myself, God can do anything. He doesn't need me. And you listen to your body. And I listen to my body. That's right. That's all of it. You just nailed it right there. God gave us such an incredible, like, what he wants us to do, what he intends for us. Your body is literally the thing that you can watch and see and understand it. Your physical body will teach you incredible spiritual truth. It gets tired. It needs rest. It's crazy, isn't it? And so for women, because your body goes through so many different phases, and especially during child, you know, child rearing years, I, I have people ask me this all the time, like, well, you know, should you work, you know, after you have your baby, should you go back to work? Well, as a lactation consultant, I say, listen to your breasts. Are you leaking milk everywhere at work? <laughs> Maybe you should be with your baby. Like, listen to your body first. It actually physically hurts when you don't nurse your baby when you're breastfeeding. That's a pretty obvious like God moment of being like, oh yeah, yeah, that's not really what I intended. Like, I didn't want you to hurt. Nurse your baby. Be together if you can. The fact that we have been able to like subject our bodies to so much like, no, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna grit through this thing. I'm gonna alter, suppress, change surgically, chemically. I'm gonna make my body do something. Guys, that is not what God intended for our bodies. Even with aging, this has been a whole new area that we've been, I've been starting to like theologically dive into like the aesthetics, the aesthetics market with aging. You're all young, so you don't feel this yet. But when you become a woman of my age, all your friends' foreheads stop moving. <laughs> and you're like, what is happening? <laughs> like all their wrinkles go away and they stop being very expressive. And you realize they're all using Botox. And I just have been thinking a lot about that lately. I'm like, did God really desire botulism in our foreheads? I don't think so. I mean, God didn't intend for us to age and decay and die in the first place. So there's that. He put us in Eden. We sinned. We brought the fall. We brought the decay. We brought death into the world. But God will allow it. We can fight it all we want, but God's going to allow it. And we can age gracefully. We can age with God. Or we can fight it tooth and nail. But the reality is around us biologically. Our bodies will start to shut down. We will die. That's a really good way to live your life with that in mind every day. And that's also your body guiding you as to what phase of life am I in right now? You know, what's important for me right now as a you know, 15-year-old when I have tons of energy? What's important to me when I'm a 45-year-old with a little less energy? What's important to me as a 94-year-old where I can have my wisdom and my knowledge that can be passed on, but maybe I'm not going to be so effective running a marathon? Like, Listen to your body and let it kind of guide you throughout your life. I don't understand it quite as well from the male perspective. I'm not a guy. I know things change a little, 
I understand it much more from the female perspective. And it's a wild ride, ladies. Like, I understand why we were susceptible to feminism. I understand why the lies and the gender stereotypes become a very easy sort of like guide for us because our bodies are a hot mess and they're hard to track, but they're important to track and pay attention to because motherhood and the spiritual nature of being a woman is critical to balance the masculine nature of men. Without motherhood, without femininity in the world, I mean, John Paul II talks about this. Um, actually, the closing lines of Vatican Council II talk about this. The final closing paragraphs of Vatican Council II when it met right around the time, you know, Humana Vitae was released around that time, and then after that comes Theology of the Body a little bit later. Um, but it talks about women hold back the hand of men where in a moment of folly he might destroy humanity. Because it said, it lies to you women who are the first to accept life and who sit beside the cradle and who sit beside the deathbed. It is you women who understand life. It is you women who give dignity to life. Hold back the hand of man. And I read that and I was like, that's the balance. That's the balance that's missing when we don't embrace our femininity, when we don't embrace our uniqueness as women. Our bodies, by the way, tell us what our job is as women. We physically receive others into ourselves. We have a hospitality where we give another dignity to say, you are worthy of coming within me. I respect you and I trust you because I believe you are good enough that I will welcome you into my body. Think about that for a second spiritually, like what that means to a man to have someone trust him and hold them on such a pedestal that they would allow that kind of hospitality. We physically welcome someone into us, we receive a portion of this other person, and then we protect and nourish and multiply it to go out into the world to become a unique human being. Like, think about all the spiritual parts of this, you guys. What our bodies physically do, the spiritual ramifications of what that is, we envelop and nurture and protect life within ourself that is not us. We don't demand that it become ourself. We have the humility, or we should, to allow someone to be different and still give our life for them, still respect them, still give them dignity. You know the saying, like, only a mother could love that one? You've heard that, like... <laughs> It actually means something. There are people that are just, you know, not very likable. But a mother's heart, women have the ability to see beyond and to see the good traits, to see the lovable things. Women can do that more easily and more readily than men. That's a gift. That's our motherhood. We can see that there's something positive about this human being. And then beyond, you know, nurturing this life, growing it, multiplying it, sending it out, then we continue to nourish and feed it with our breasts for like years. Like our physical body tells us exactly what the spiritual gifts are that we bring to the world as women. That's pretty dang awesome, you guys. So as females, the fact that you were born with a female body, the fact that this is the way that God made you, he didn't make a mistake, you owe it to God in some way to become fully who you were, who you are. Thoughts on that? Is that challenging? Okay. <laughs> it's challenging for me. I don't know. It's challenging for you. <laughs> You're a man. You don't have the same. <laughs> I, it feels empowering. I don't know how the women feel. But... I think it feels heavy as a woman. I, I think it feels like a huge obligation in some ways. But it's also like it, when, you, when you hear it, it feels like too much. Like, how can I be all these things? But when you actually just like surrender to it, there's a profound peace. And it feels very natural. Um, and I'm so grateful that my body guided me that I had all these kids, because I wouldn't have probably done that. But as I began having babies, um, we actually lost our first baby last year. So we had our first miscarriage. I know it was actually really crazy for me to like process that. Because we had always had just such good fertility, you kind of take it for granted that you're going to be able to get pregnant, you're going to have kids, and you find out you're pregnant, you're just like, okay, we're having a baby. And then when you lose that baby, that was 
really an important moment for me. Like I think I, I, I had been coming a long way, you know, in the last 20 years, but to actually lose a baby, to realize like as a mother, like my heart's desire was just to hold that baby and protect it and care for it. Like every piece of me just wanted my baby. Even though you don't even know you want that baby. Even though you're like, I didn't even plan for that baby. Like I didn't even realize I wanted that until it's taken away. And then you're like, I was made for that. And something is incomplete now. And something is broken. And something is so sad and so wrong. And it's such a fallen world. And what it makes you want more than anything is to get to heaven. Because you're like, somebody's waiting. <laughs> it makes me cry, you guys. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but I hope that some of these things, that you can learn these things earlier than I did. And that, that you can share this truth with the world. The world's not going to tell you the truth. But you're made to mother, you're made to father, you're made for one another, you're not made for isolation, you're made to be together. Feminism sure is not going to tell you that. <laughs> Don't fall for it. There is a new feminism that John Paul II called for. That's the type of feminism that I wish the Barbie movie would have talked about. A world where there's complementarity. A world where women are fully women and men are fully men and it's not cheap stereotypes. It's not pretty girls in high heels and strong guys with oiled chests. It's Men and women, it's human beings. It's not Barbie and Ken. We're human. And that radical gift of self and that radical acceptance of the other, it's just a family. Okay, speaking of the family, I've got the Holy Family shirts I've got to give away. I don't know if anybody wants, you should pass, I don't know if we want to pass around for the drawing. If anybody wants to throw your name in there, I'll do a drawing. Does anybody have any other questions or thoughts? Just things? Yes. My best dating advice. Oh Lord, this is not good. We don't let our kids date until they're 16. So that's, um, but my daughter turned 16 on January 11th. And on January 14th, a nice little young man showed up at my door. <laughs> and had to have a serious talk with us. All 15 years of him. My husband had to restrain himself from throwing him off the porch. <laughs> we had a nice talk with him. And so, I, I, I mean, I remember it from the years where I actually was dating, but as a parent, oh my gosh, you guys, it's so different. It's so different to watch your kids start dating and the advice you give your kids. Because I hear myself saying things my parents said, like, just don't do this, just don't do that, you know? Um, but I think my best advice for dating is exactly what I've been saying the whole time. Know yourself. Value yourself. Like, really understand who you are. And the right person is going to affirm back to you who God made you to be. They're going to help heal you. They're going to help be that... that I mean, when I first met my husband, I was coming off of a bad breakup. Probably not the great time to meet your husband, but... Probably a little vulnerable, I don't know. <laughs> but the things that he said to me were true. And I knew it. And I had been with somebody for a long time who had been subtly making me feel less than. Like they were not true. Like, he, like my previous boyfriend prior to the, my husband had, you know, had said things like, we just, you know, like, but mean jabs. Things like, oh, well, you're not very whatever. And you internalize it. And in my brain, I'm like, oh, I didn't think I was that way. Like, I knew it wasn't true, but yet, like, somebody's telling you something, but, like, it, it doesn't resonate. Run. If somebody is like that where it's not lining up with who you know God made you to be, run. I, I think that's my best advice on dating. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, snap. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what's your best advice on dating? <laughs> okay, what's your question? Oh, good for you. I feel like it's really hard because I really love being an intelligent, ambitious, and driven person. And I derive a lot of pride from that, a lot yep. of sense of self from that. So how do I balance being a woman that likes adding something to the conversation, who has something to say, and still being able to exude that femininity and that softness and that peace in order to not only like, send that message to the world of who I am, but to attract the right person to that. 
You're going to be a strong, ambitious, driven woman who's giving her voice in every setting. You're going to be a strong, ambitious woman who's got a baby on her hip. You're going to be a strong, that's who you are. You're a strong, ambitious woman with opinions. Can we ask a follow-up? Yes. When you became a mother, did you feel like you were losing that part of yourself that exists only for yourself, like beyond serving other people, that's just for you, that that's that intelligent, like driven, like hardworking thing that you lost now that you're giving it to children? Yes, I did. And then I realized that was the only thing that was going to take me to my knees for me to understand that it was all God in the first place. That it shouldn't have ever been about me. That I thought I was strong and ambitious and smart and all those things. And it was really God that was giving me gifts to be ambitious and driven. And I had to be brought to my knees. And I had to be humbled. And I had to have four babies in five years for me to be absolutely broken, in a sense, but resigned to say, Lord, whatever you want, I'll serve you however you want. And it was at that point then, it was honestly, I went to confession, had the whole thing with the priest, like, oh, we've been like faithful, we're using NFP, we're doing all the things. I was mad. I went to confession, and I was mad. And this priest said, God can handle it. You go get in your car, take a drive, and you yell at God. He said, and after you're done yelling at God, and after you're done, come back and do your penance. <laughs> and I took a drive, and I, I lost my voice. Like, I screamed. Like, I had to get to that point of just, Lord, what do you want? How do you want to use me? Because I think I have these gifts. And I think I'm supposed to do this and this and this, but I can't do any of it because you keep giving me these kids and I know they're beautiful, but I just, it's so much work. Like I had to like work through all of it. But I, I came out on the other side recognizing that it's all from him. None of it's me. So if he wants me to break, if he wants me to hit my knees for a while so that I will finally let him pull me back up and let whatever I do be his glory and not my own, because that's the temptation. That in the end, that I'll be like, I did all these things for you, Jesus. And he's like, no, I used you to do these things. Yeah, does that make sense? I had to have kids to do that. I don't know. I don't know what you guys are going to need, but. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? All right, here. Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, one of the ideas I really liked was just listening to your body, finding your identity in your body. Um, and, and maybe you can't answer this question because it's a guy question. I get guy questions and I'm always like, Father. <laughs> well, I think it might be different for men. I feel that being a man, ideally, and I want to know what you think of this, is knowing when to listen to your body Mm. And also knowing when to fight your body. Ooh. For example, working out or giving that up that desire to have some ice cream. Mm. What do you think of that? I think that because of our fallen world, we have disordered desires. And so I think that falls under that maybe. Women also have to fight the body sometimes just to do the right thing. I think my temptation would be towards, you know, is it asceticism, laziness? Is that the word? <laughs> asceticism? I mean, I'd love to just lay in bed till noon every day and not get up and take care of my kids. I think that's my temptation where I fight the body of like, what is the right thing right now to do? I listen to my body to a degree, but then at a certain point, it's no longer just resting and taking care of myself. It now is falling into vice. And so there's always that question of like virtue or vice. Like what is, ha am I caring for myself right now or am I allowing myself to be hurt in a sense. Um, I do think it's different for men though. My husband and I have had this conversation quite a bit actually about disordered desires in men and women and what men are tempted to. And he said the same thing, that the body is not a, as good of a guide for men as it is for women because it's much more steady. 
So women have to pay attention because we don't know if it's progesterone that's messing us up at this moment or estrogen or if it's not good sleep. Like if we know what's going on hormonally, it helps us to discern. But you guys actually don't have that change. You're steady. You should be. I mean, your testosterone should just stay right about here, you know, and slowly over the course of your life <laughs> work its way down. And so I think if you're experiencing like big shifts in desire or temptation, like that's, that's probably of a spiritual nature. That's not of a physical nature. Um, I, so I don't think your body is a guide in the same way that ours is. Like I do think that there has to be a different type of discernment there. I don't know. Is that, what do you think, Father? I don't know. Men and women, you hear confessions. <laughs> I think with all of our desires, as you mentioned, to bring it to the Lord and to kind of say, is this going to make me more truly who I am uh, in the image of Christ or not? And then also the self gift aspect, because the tendency is to be selfish. And so, how does is this helping me to make a better self gift? Mm hmm. Does that answer your question at all? You were kind of getting at a specific thing. Like, what do you mean with working out? I'm super curious now. I'm like, what does that mean? Oh, I meant like going to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but like, what's the, like, what would be the bad part of that? I mean, there's a good thing. I don't know. Is it? Well, I, when I meant fight, I wasn't necessarily um, saying that men fighting their bodies was a bad thing. I feel like men more often than not find their identity fighting against their bodies. Oh. Pushing that weight that they really don't think they can push, but all the men are gathered around them and cheering them on. <laughs> <laughs> the I can do hard things moment. Yeah. Which I do think is a rite of passage for like boys as they become men. I have four sons. And until they get to that moment of like, okay, I, I am a man, I can do hard things, oh my gosh, they're whiny. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, um, many years ago, years ago, I was a slob. Mm. And it came down to the point where I came home and my mom and my sister were watching my 600 pound life on TLC. <laughs> And I was watching that, and I just realized, that's where I'm going. Wow. And when I started working out, it was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. And everything in my body told me not to. Got it. Uh, now I'm understanding it. I fight my body to find my identity. So, okay, I think I hear what you're saying now. Okay. When you were done working out, so in the process of working out, was it your body that was screaming stop, 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 or was it your mind? And this is, I think, when you're truly, truly like listening to your body, there is some, unless there's like a, a disease or inflammation or something actually wrong with your body, working out is something that when you're done, you feel pretty euphoric. You feel like there should be some sense of like, that was actually good for me. I didn't really want to do it, but like if you're listening very, very closely to your body, there is some discernible, I'm a little better than I was before. You know? Like there should be, if you're really closely watching your body, you'll see, you know, subtle changes that are happening, weight loss, muscle definition, you know, good things. Um, I think for men, sometimes I've seen the opposite, or a little beyond the temptation of vanity. Like the guy at the gym that takes 15,000 selfies in the mirror. <laughs> like, I've also seen him. <laughs> do you want to draw? Ready for a draw? Let's do it. We'll wrap it up. All right, I'm going to draw the first name, and you can go up and pick whatever you want. Is this Emma Line? Emma Lean? Emma, Emma Line? Is it pronounced? <laughs> Miguel, he wants it. Daniel Little. Daniel? Yay! Woohoo! Nice job, Daniel. Wait a, wait a, put your name in there. Last one. Gabe Cole? 
my gosh. Right here. Way to go. I like my front row seats. Uh, you may get a girl's shirt. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Give it to somebody you love. Okay. Uh, take the books. Take the books and give it to a happy girl that needs to be whole. <laughs> So you can go on the Guiding Star Project website if you want to order these books. Um, the Catholic book you can only get in person, so lucky you. Okay, Father, I'll let you close it up, and then I'll hang around if anybody wants to hang out and chat tonight. Thank you, Leah. Lord God, you who created all things and gave us life because you believed the world would be a better place with us in it. That the world is forever different and better and unique because of our uniqueness, our, the fact that we are irrepeatable, irreplaceable. Lord, help us to receive and see the goodness you created us with, who we are. And that, Lord, in you, by your grace, you desire that we would share in your better, that we would become better, more virtuous, become more like your son, Jesus. Yes, Lord, give us the freedom, guided by your grace, and light of truth, to be who you made us to be. And Lord, give us hope and faith and patience that perhaps if you're calling us to marriage, that that other person would be protected and watched over, mm. that they also would become the person you're creating them to be with the, the best capacity to love so that we can be happily married or whatnot, whatever that little location is. And so, Father, bless us. Give us understanding on this campus to understand the gift of our bodies. And Father, I ask your blessing upon these, your beloved sons and daughters, in whom you are well pleased this night. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A couple of announcements of things coming up. Next weekend, next Thursday, our Newman night, for the first time, we have Hot Ones with the Priest. Yeah. That sounds fun. So you got to bring your questions and uh, have a little fun here next week. Uh, adoration is going, starting next week, Monday, all day Monday, all day Thursday. There's a couple time slots. Ideally, we'd love two people in each time slot. So if you don't have a 30-minute time slot yet, um, maybe the Lord's inviting you to do that, where you know every week you'll spend that time, uh, not just next week, but every week. So, uh, Monday, uh, not everyone was able to make it to Seek to Saint, for, in St. Louis, and so we're having a Seek party, a post-Seek party, Monday at 7, where we're going to watch my favorite talk, Monsignor James Shea. Yeah, so Woo! good, so good. So, you didn't miss out, so come, we're going to gather, we're going to be in the back and just hang out and uh, a little food or whatnot. And, so that's Monday at 7. Uh, yeah, if you don't know what you're doing for spring break, then you are welcome to come. Uh, the staff doesn't know this yet, but to go with me and one of my staff members to go hang out with the Carmelite Sisters in California. So Monday through Friday, so you have your two weekends, and we're going to go, and so there's, we're going to do some service, and then some hanging out in Southern California, end up at the beach, just because it's there, and uh, <laughs> come back. So service. Yeah, hang out with the sisters. We don't always have a chance to do that. So there's a QR code or whatnot on the board. The cost is 300 bucks. We can help you fundraise a little bit for that. Uh, so we want to know sooner than later if you're interested in that. Uh, yeah. So I'm good. We do have, I, I, I made do all my promise. The staff did. We have some apple dump cake. Cherry? Apple dump cake? Cherry. Looks cherry. Cherry, dump cake, and, and ice cream. All that talk about ice cream. So, uh, but let's thank the, Leah for making the trip. Weekend. Men's weekend is starting tomorrow at 5.30 at the parish. We still have room, so it's tomorrow evening, you go home, you stay in your own bed, all that stuff, and then come back all day Saturday. We've got a bunch of uh, guys from ASU coming up, and so it's just gonna, we're going to do some fun stuff. Um, we'll be in the gym, and then do some other stuff, nature, all that stuff uh, this weekend. So it's 50 bucks. If you need help with that, let me know. Uh, but we'd love to have more gentlemen. Um, Go, grow brotherhood and holiness. So cool. Okay, hang out, mingle, and enjoy your evening.